Right, we're on. This is episode 178. We have got no guest. Essentially, I'm the guest. This is a q and I've done one of these before. Um, I'm going to do them every so often. There's occasionally uh, requests. So occasionally people ask me questions via social media um, or via the the, the HR Discord community, the community on Discord. And, and sometimes... Uh, it can be. I try and minimise my time on social media, and so sometimes there's questions posed, and they just they just require a long winded answer. You know, something needs explaining, uh, and I think uh, it's much better done in person, or you know, like this, verbally to explain it. Um, it's certainly been the case uh, recently. So here we are, episode one seventy eight. The que- so people have submitted questions ahead of this. I put out a call for questions, and I did that on Twitter. I did it on Instagram, and I like I said, I did it in the H Hour community on Discord. The, the Discord app for those who are, who aren't aware, it's a free app. It's a, a community engagement app. It's its origins are in uh, software development and uh, and things like that. It's heavily used by blockchain uh, communities, organizations, companies. But essentially, it's a it's an app where you can engage with each other in in, in, uh, in a variety of ways. I mean, what I like about it is that when you join the Discord app, you don't have to, there's no requirement to publicly put your name, your phone number, your email address. You can remain, you can remain completely anonymous on there, really. Um, you know, when you register, you need to register, depending on the, the, the server settings, and the HR server, the settings on there is I think you need to register with an email address, I think. But I don't see that email address, it's just to do it. That's me minimising the chance of bots getting in there, right? Uh, but yeah, you, you can be anonymous. You can engage with you can engage with other patrons. Or if you're not a patron, you can engage with the patrons and engage with other members. Anyway, questions have, <coughs> questions have been submitted in the, in the Discord server. And questions have been submitted via Instagram. I don't think I got any via Twitter, but there was loads on Instagram. So I'm going to go work through them now, um, and we'll see where we get. We will see where we get. So I will be, if you're watching this and you see me looking down, it's because I've got them on my phone in front of me, right? Uh, right. <clears throat> I'm going to start off with one uh, submitted on Instagram by, uh, by Neville Johnson. As you get older, he asks, as you get older, how do you deal with mental ill health? This is a good question, um, because I think uh, the, this is a good question, to, and it can be a difficult question to try and articulate the answer to, and it's a question that probably a lot of people want to know. Never mind the getting older thing, but how do you deal with mental ill health, right? Um, because uh, because one of the one I think one of the characteristics of mental ill health when it affects someone for the first time or someone doesn't understand it really is they don't really know how to deal with it. They don't really know what's going on. So it can be difficult. But I'll explain how I deal with it now. So I have the advantage now of, of, of being through the middle. You know, I have my own experience with mental and health over a protracted period of time. And I'm on the, I'm, I'm on the up from that. You know, I'm, I'm, I mean, um, I'm on the incline. I'm getting out of it. You know, I'm, I think I'm where, I'm very near where I want to be. Uh, in terms of my mental health. And so now it's a case of sustaining my mental health where it is now, or if it dips, because everybody's mental health dips every so often, right? It'll, it'll, it'll get bad to some degree for whatever reason. Bad day at work, you lose a loved one, you lose a friend, you lose a family member, or you you get injured and you can't train and that impacts you because you because you can't, you can't do as much physical activity as you want to do so you lack your motivation uh, any number of things that makes you feel like shit right when you, if it's something that makes you feel like shit and you it, and you continue to feel like shit for a period longer than it, that sh- it would be normal then you can argue that your mental health has dipped a little bit right as in to a need to pay attention so. I now try and treat my mental health like I do my physical health. With your physical health, we're all we, we're all really sub. Most of us, ninety nine point nine percent of us, are subconsciously aware of what our physical health is all of the time, subconsciously. And when a physical health issue goes on long enough, and that length of time is dependent on what the issue is, then we bring it to the forefront of our attention, and quite often we'll say, "My God." 
I realised, for example, my knee was killing me yesterday. Or I had a little niggle there yesterday. Why, had, why didn't I do anything about it then? Well, actually, you bring it to your forefront of your attention. Yesterday, you subconsciously realised you had a little niggle in your, in your knee. You didn't do anything about it. Or you had a headache that's not going away for days. Or you're just feeling a, bit, a little bit under the weather. You've, your stomach's not feeling quite right. And then the next day... You're pissing and shitting and spewing everywhere, right? <laughs> Whereas the day before you could have done something. That's going subconscious recognition of an issue and then consciously bringing it forward and doing something about it, recognizing it. We don't do that in mental health, I think. Most people, they don't get to the position of subconsciously realizing something's an issue. So it takes, it's, it has to be much more serious before it gets brought to the conscious where you think, my God, I am really not good. Some people, it never gets to that point, and they're the ones that really go off, pardon the pun, off the edge of a cliff. You know, it's just all too too little, too late. Uh, everything compounds itself. But I try really hard when I realise, when something gets brought to the forefront of my attention in terms of my mental health. And usually for me, so my like my combat indicators of, you're not, you're under the weather here. And you need to do something about it, or else it'll keep going downhill. Uh, uh, high levels of stress, where there shouldn't really be any stress. Nothing, nothing major has changed in my circumstance, like my environment, my life, my job, my, my relationships, whatever. Um, high levels of stress, or uh, difficulty to get out of bed in the morning, which rarely happens. Um, or a lack of motivation to go and do physical fitness. Those are the, or an increase in alcohol intake. Those are the combat indicators for me. And so I, I uh, yeah. So those things are indicators of my mental health. My, my mental health has declined slightly. Um, so I pull those to the forefront of my attention. Or I pull it, the fact that I recognise, okay, there may be an issue here that I need to get on top of because I don't want it going down the pan like it did as done previously and put me in a really bad way for a long time. I put it at the forefront of my attention and the first, there's two things I do. I do an immediate action drill. So those of you are military or ex-military listening to this, I have an IA drill for when I think, okay, I need to, I need to kickstart my brain back into a more positive uh, state, a more positive state. The IA drill is essentially changing my environment through, uh, changing my environment through physical activity. So I will make sure I take myself for a walk or I take myself for a run or I go to the gym or uh, I go boxing or I do or I go paddle boarding. Basically, I take myself out of my the environment that I've been in because usually um, one of the one of the what's the word not factors, but one of the things that happens when my mental health declines slightly is I I my scope of uh, sort of experiences day to day uh, reduces. So we all, well, like I say, all of us, we've got a day job. So we go to work and then we come home, or we've got to work and then we don't work. I'll see with the thing of uh, working from home now. We've got to work and then we're not working, it's downtime. Um, so I like to be really active, physical fitness in the morning and or in the evening, let it go for walks and all that. If my if my mental health is taken a, a a step down, I tend to not be doing those extracurricular activities, if you want to call them that, as much, if at all, and so uh, and so that can compound the mental ill health effect because you're not getting any stimuli, you're not doing things to release the endorphins, you're not giving yourself an adrenaline rush, you know, just through I mean, just through physical activity, you're not doing those things that jolt the body out of its normal state of crap life stuff work for example right so I'll my IA drills I'll do some physical fitness or go for a walk one or two of those things at the same time I'll do it I'll try and do an analysis of I don't I don't try I do I do an assessment an analysis of why I think my mental health has taken a dip and it's either going to be because of an external, as an outside of my mind, an external factor, uh, a situation at work, a situation in a relationship, be that uh, kids, 
be that family, be that partner, be that friends. So like a negative situation, you know, you've had an argument or or um, you're worrying about someone or in the work example, you've got a big project or maybe you think your job's at risk or you're having a bit of a conflict with uh, a member of staff and it's taking its toll on you. Uh, it's either going to be that kind of thing or it's going to be something physically related. So, you know, uh, a serious injury or a, an injury like a chronic injury where you're consistently in pain, constantly in pain, that can have and does have an impact on your mental health. So it's either going to be the external, it's going to be physical, or you're not going to be able to pinpoint it. So in the example, that there's nothing external. So I look at, when I, when I recognise that mental ill health situation, I think, okay, what's my situation now? What's my external situation now? Is it any different to the last time I can remember feeling on top on top of my game? Because if I think, hey, last Monday, I was feeling fine. Like I remember saying to my girlfriend, I feel really good. Like, just in general, life is good. Work is good. And then fast forward a week later, I'm not feeling great. I'll think, what's changed? I'll try and work out what's changed between now and that point in the past where I was good. And if I can't identify anything that's changed, then the IA drill is even more important. Because the IA drill will either help me identify what the issue is, or it'll, or it'll just dismiss the issue completely. And the IA drill being, for me, physical activity. It may not be the IA drill for you, it could be something else. It could be picking up the phone to someone. It could be, I don't know, watching a motivational video that you like, listening to your favorite music. It could be going to the doctor. It could be um, any number of things, whatever works for you. And it takes time to find out. Uh, yeah, most of the time, my, most of the time, when my mental health dips, and I do that analysis, which is a split second, by the way, that analysis is not me sitting down <laughs> and wargaming it with like a pen and paper and going, okay, X, Y, and Z, and these are the factors now, and these, what were the factors then, and, and scoring things and all that palaver. Um, it's a split second. I literally think, okay, what's this between now and last week? Well, now and the last time was good. Nothing. Hmm, going to grip yourself, you. Most of the time, when my, my mental health dips, it's, uh, it's because of um, something stressful at work uh, and, and I get immersed in it and I take my foot off the gas with my physical activity in, term, in, in that I, I don't do it as frequently or I don't do it at all. And my alcohol intake goes up. And the three things combined there bring on the mental health dip. Stress at work, Increased alcohol intake, alcohol is a fucking depressant. It's not beat around the bush, it has its uses, but it's a depressant. And then the third one is it taking your foot off the gas with physical activity, which alone is, a, is shit, a nightmare. So, yeah, my age room, I go and do physical, physical fitness. In the event that uh, there has been times in the past, in the event where that doesn't resolve things, so uh, this has been ongoing, I can't snap out of a d d decreased. Um, state of happiness, if you want to call it that, then I will go to the doctor. Or I or I have in the past got the doctor, or I have spoken to the, my regimental association welfare officer. Even though I'm out now, you, we, you can still do that as a as an ex-military or an ex-service person. You can get in touch with your association and they, they can help. Uh, or SAFA. SAFA's uh, um, the main point of call because they will refer, they'll handle a referral onto them anyway. I hope that answers your question, Neville. It was quite, well, quite long-winded. Um, that's how I do with my mental ill health. You got it. You got, with the mental ill health, whoever you are, whatever age you are, whatever situation is, as soon as you recognise that it is that it is, it's had a dip, you need to address it consciously. You need to, and that may be uncomfortable sometimes. You really need to sit down and think, why am I feeling this way? What could it be? It's either going to be outside your control. Um, or it's going to be within your control. Uh, when I say it's outside your control, your immediate control, you you can't directly do anything about it. I mean, that's that's an example of... I don't know what that would be an example of, actually. Outside your control. Oh, well. Someone dying, you know. Um, or a, 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 a difficult situation at work. The situation's out of your control, but what's within your control is how you perceive it, how you act with it, and how you... Position yourself to handle the stress better. Make sure you're eating well. 
make sure you're doing physical fitness. Make sure you're getting out and, sur- and changing your surroundings, getting those stimuli going, and that'll help that puts your brain in a better place. You can handle stress better. That's why physical fit physical fitness is so important. That's why testing your brain, brain work is so important. Reading, writing. Anyway, hope that answers the question. Cheers, Neville. Okay, this question is from Run Tap Shoot. Is Cheesy ever coming back on? So Cheesy, Michael Royal. Cheesy came on twice early. Say early. Yeah, he was in the first one. He was twice. He was on twice in the first one hundred episodes. Uh, we served together uh, in three para, and um, and to answer your question. He can come back on if he wants to. I have invited him. But I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, yeah. And I am not willing to elaborate on it any more than that. But yeah, hopefully, hopefully, Cheesy comes back on. Yeah, hopefully. Fingers crossed. Uh, right. What do I do as a job? This is from Matt doing stuff. I am a project manager. I am a project manager for a satellite communications company called Inmarsat. Been there since early 2019 um, and uh, yeah I love it actually great company to work for very very rewarding work challenging work and there's a great cohort of ex-military there and Civ Pop there are good as well <laughs> uh, yeah it was actually a, it was actually a, um, a podcast guest that introduced me to in my sat called Paul Godonis back in 2018 and I work there now. Yeah, cool. So in my side, that's what I'm a project manager. Next question from Mark Hightower. Did you attempt selection? If not, why not? No, I didn't. And I have given this question thought because Well I remember thinking about this. I never went for it when I was in. I remember, obviously, I didn't go for it. I just said I didn't. But I, I remember thinking about why I didn't go for selection when I was serving. And I used to say it was... I used to think it was because my only motivation to go and do it, my main motivation to go and try selection, to try and get into special forces, was for increased money just the appeal of an increased salary and now and that was part of it like I I mean Ali I don't I didn't have I don't know did I have the appetite I'm going to come on to something else in a minute which is another part of the reason which I've realised since but the point about increased money being the only motivation which it may or may not have been for me is that it can't be your only motivation for most people if you're going to go and attempt selection then it's as much about your physical, well, it's less about your physical capability, or that is a huge part of it, but your mental ability is an even bigger part of it. And I don't think that if you are, if you are someone who isn't crazy, mad, not like top, the, the top percentile of the fittest people in British forces, but unless you were that person, you can't be anything less than fully motivated in every as in every possible aspect to go and attempt special forces selection. It cannot just be because oh that seems cool, uh, and I would like extra money. Everyone would like extra money. Can't be the sole motivation because I think you'll just fail. That's what'll happen. Um, yeah. Now coming on the other. Point that I mentioned when I was young in my career, I mean, like brand spanking you, just turn up three para. I remember at least two people who put their names down for selection and went and attempted selection, and they gave it a cursory effort. They 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 paid a lip service, like they weren't going there to try and pass selection. I knew this, and other people knew this. It was as transparent as you could get it. And the reason they put their names down for selection and went and gave it as a bullshit effort was because in their heads they thought that it would make them 
So in terms of their career prospects within three para, bearing in mind they probably had no intention or no absolute belief in themselves they could get into Hereford or into Poole, was that the sole intent was that by going and attempting selection, they thought that that would falsely demonstrate to their uh to their platoon commanders, to their company commanders, to the CO, to the people who could make decisions on their career in terms of promotion, they thought it would it would falsely demonstrate that they were super keen or really skilled because they got an attempt to say, oh, look at me, I want to attempt this selection. Oh, he must be a keen guy, let's promote him. I saw at least two people do that. When I was, when I, they, were, they were NCOs, I was just a Tom. And I think that really put me off. It really put me off. No, no, no. I'll rephrase that. Not put me off. It made me analyse if I was going to go for selection, why, really, why did I want to do it? Because I didn't want to be someone who went and attempted selection and let's say I didn't pass and come back. And I didn't want other people to think that about me. Um, I, yeah, I didn't want that. So I, it caused me to analyse why I want to do selection. And when I thought about it, I think I thought, meh. Yeah, Money would be good. Extra money would be good. I didn't even know how much extra they got at the time, to be honest. And um, and it'd be alley. It'd be cool. But aside from that, I, I don't know. Is that the only... I, from my perspective, that's what I thought. That's not motivation enough. But then thinking about it now, what are the motivations you need? <laughs> that's a cool job. Um, I'd like more money. Uh, well, and the third one is, I think it could pass, you know. Um, so, yeah. That's why I didn't go for it. Uh... Hmm. Okay, where are we now? Where are we now? Chris Clues, Cluesy. Why are you such a handsome bastard? Well, that's subjective, I think, Chris, whether I'm a handsome bastard or not. Some would argue there's no way on this planet I'm a handsome bastard because I'm ginger, just just based on that fact alone. Uh, but to answer your question... Because my parents are mingers. Good gene pool, mate. Good genes, good genes. Mike Valance has asked, would I, if I had an option to go, would I have gone to Woodstock 1969 or Woodstock 1999, i.e. the festivals? No, this is off the back of Mike recommending a documentary to me, which is three parts on Netflix right now, and it's called Woodstock, and that's called Trainwreck Woodstock 99. And for those of you not aware, there was a, a Woodstock 2, if you want to call it that, held in, uh, organised and held in 1999. And it was a fucking disaster. I wasn't even aware of it until I watched a documentary literally last week. Disaster. Mental. Like, you have to watch a three-parter. What a create, like, mismanaged, misorganised, plus a whole lot of other factors, a quarter of a million people on a disused military airfield at this, what was meant to be Woodstock event. Like, peace and love and happy, happy. It did not turn out like that. <laughs> it's fucking mental. Go and watch Woodstock 99. Uh, uh, Trainwreck Woodstock 99 on uh, Netflix. You will not be disappointed. Um, so to answer Mike's question, I would have done... Of the two, of the two I mean, 99 would be mental. But Woodstock 69. 100%. Send me back there. Flower power. All of the LSD. Give me all of the LSD. Give me all of the cannabis. Give me all of the flowers. Give me all of the mushrooms, and I would be quite happy. Happy, happy, happy. Listen to Jimi Hendrix. With Bob Dylan there? I think Bob Dylan was there. All of those people would have been unbelievable. Unbelievable. What a time. What a time. So, that answers your question. Okay, Tim Ford asks, Mate, if you'd have not joined Power Reg, what would you have done? Hmm... <laughs> I think I would not have done much at all. I would not have achieved much at all. Well, have I achieved much now? I think I would have achieved less than I've achieved now, if anything at all. And then the reason being is, so I joined the military, really, to sort of try and find myself, prove myself to myself. I was not a... I was not... I joined when I was... When did I join? Uh, oh, man, yeah, I was 18 when I joined. Yeah, I was 18 when I joined. 
and I was an 18 year old who was, had no self confidence, no self esteem. Uh, I, I couldn't look people in the eye, you'd have a conversation really, unless I, unless we were really close friends. Um, I was not who I am now. And I think I recognised that myself at the time. I wasn't happy with myself. I was not happy with myself at all. Was not. I had no pride in myself whatsoever. And everyone should have an ounce of pride in themselves, at least. Um, because you all have value. You all bring, all bring something to the party. And I did not. I did not. I was, I, I, I was a weed. I was an absolute weed. When you think of a, you know, when you think of a, a man, I was not a man. Even at 18 years old, I was, I was not an 18 year old lad. I was, um, I was just, uh, I was not used to man obese as weak, a weak individual, uh, for, for, for reasons I don't, I'll ever, I'll ever understand. My parents aren't like that. You know, my, my sister isn't like that. Um, so I don't know, I don't know why I was like, I've got a few ideas, but, but, uh, yeah, so if I hadn't joined that, well, I'd probably, I don't know, I'd probably have some, I don't know. I'd probably be a very bitter person. I'd be a very unhappy person. Um, and I would not bring any benefit to society whatsoever. I think, you know, people who, who unfortunately, you know, they, they shy away from just life. They, for whatever reason, for, I'm not saying they're bad people. I was like that. You know, they shy away from life. They're not... They're not a positive interaction. They're not. They're not a positive interaction to experience. Um, they're just not a benefit to society, to society. And plus, it's a deeply unhappy way to live. I think so. I would have. Yeah, you know, I would have been a deeply unhappy person. Not where I am now. Uh, yeah, maybe I would have joined some other unit. I don't know. I. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, the fact I joined Power Edge just by just by chance. My initial choice is going to be RAF. Uh, I think I had pilot to my head or something like that, you know, something a bit, <laughs> well, not easy, but something uh, cool, Ali, uh, as I was thinking at the time, being a, being a civvy. Maybe I wouldn't have joined up, you know, but uh, things have been very different. Thanks for the question, Tim. Okay. Richard Cam, 1985, on Instagram, asks, would I rather fight... A horse-sized duck, or fifty duck-sized horses. So would I rather <laughs> would I rather fight a horse-sized duck, or fifty duck-sized horses? <sighs> now, it kind of does depend on what breed the horses are, right? But I don't think actually make much difference because they all be about the same height. However. Can you imagine a horse-sized duck? Just imagine that for a minute in your mind. A horse-sized duck. That thing. Like, imagine the size of its wings. My God. And birds in general are fucking ruthless. They are fucking ruthless. They will destroy you, given half the chance. There's a flock of them. Now, imagine a horse-sized duck. That thing is... That thing is taking you away. That's swooping down, right? It's picking you up by your head. Probably crush your head in its beak. It's picking you up. It's picking all your friends up. You're all gone. You're like fucking gone. I mean, the only saving grace for the duck, right, is they got the, they got the, um, they got the web feet of night. So they couldn't like grab you and pierce you with the talons like an eagle could. But its beak is going to get you. And if it wallops you with its, with its wings, you're going to get snapped in half. So, yeah, no, I don't want, yeah, 50, I'd fight 50, 50 duck-sized horses all day long, all day long. I mean, fucking hell, yeah, it doesn't even bear thinking about it, I'd probably have a nightmare about that time, actually, a duck, a horse-sized duck, <laughs> whisking you off to wherever the fuck it lives, Mordor, or Narnia, or wherever it comes from. <laughs> no, thank you, I will fight the 50 duck-sized horses. Good question. <laughs> okay, Mark Cundy. Do you ever find peace with a failed marriage and the games played with the kids? Right. I can't speak for your situation. If it's your situation or a friend's situation, um, I don't know. 
I'd like to think that with most uh, separated parents, divorced parents situations, that kids aren't used as pawns uh, uh, to be played emotionally for gain or pain in one way or the other. Uh, do you ever, do you ever find peace with a failed marriage? Yeah, is the answer to that question. <sighs> Marriages that fail, sometimes it's not meant to be. It's not meant to be. Um, and I think that there's two aspects to it, right? You've got, especially as kids involved, you've got one, the, the impact of a divorce or a separation on the kids. Uh, sorry, on you and the, on your partner. And then you've got the other aspect is the impact of the separation on your kids. Now, depends depends on the situation building up to the separation. But for me, it was it was a, it had been a, a long time coming in my situation. And I used to do the mental arithmetic in my head in trying to calculate, okay, if I stay in this relationship... Um, uh, what sorry? What is the what will the impact be on the children if I stay in this relationship? And what will the impact be on me if I stay in this relationship? Versus what will the impact be on me if I leave the relationship? And what will the impact be on the children who leave this relationship? Um, and you hope that if it's ended up in separation, you hope that the longer term the impact will be less than if you'd stayed together. And you can kind of, do the, the way that math can kind of end up, add up in your head, you can never get it right, because you can never know what the situation would have been if you hadn't separated. You just can't do that, you can't guess it. But you'd like to think that, okay, um, if well, if I'd stayed in that relationship, then I would become increasingly bitter and happy and angry, and the children would have been exposed to more and more arguments, and would have been not in a very nice, positive uh upbringing environment um, versus uh, the relatively short term high impact of the separation and it is not short term in, it, in the short term it's high impact obviously it's a, it, has a, it does have a long term impact on all sorts of things and whether they're more predisposed to getting divorced or separate themselves to what they perceive to be valuable in a relationship blah 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 um, what was the question oh my god Yes, you do find peace. Yeah, you, what you can't do, what you can't do, is is think, oh, uh, things will be better off if we haven't separated, because you don't know that. You don't know where it's going to go, so you have to accept the situation as for what it now, what it is now. You are where you are. I don't mean you. I mean because you may not be talking about yourself here. You are where you are as a person who's been separated. You got kids. And the focus should always be, absolutely be, being a being the best parent, father or mother, being the best parent you can be for your children who are dealing with the separation. Because my God, it you think it's an impact on the parents, the separation. Now you think about what impact that has on the mentally, on the kids, who are they're not even fully grown human beings yet. They're still trying to reconcile and understand the world. And then the two the two steadfast rocks that they've got to cling to have just separated they're no longer this unitary uh, this unit of love and trust and reliance that was there yesterday today it's been completely shattered and so you have to be that rock you have to be that that uh that element of stability in the turbulence that's going on in their mind that will go on for a long time it'll go on for a long time you have to be there and just be yeah stable emotionally stable uh, as financially stable as you can be have a home for them and provide routine where you can and and just uh, help them through it help them through it you know difficult difficult but don't beat yourself up thinking about what could have been um, because you'll never know you've got to deal with what the now is and that's how you find peace with a failed marriage it's done you can't change it got to look forward Okay, Larry Boy on Instagram. He asks, where do you see the podcast in five years' time? Oh, he's got a two-part question here. I'll come on to the second part in a minute. Five years' time. So in five years' time, I see the podcast much the same as it is now, exactly the same format, if not very similar. Uh, I'll still be following my like, rigid rule of I only 
interview people I'm interested in. That is the primary guiding factor for me having guests on. I have to be interested in them. It is not a case of... Uh, um, you know, I have to toe, the, toe an editorial line. I don't. I choose the fuck I want as guests. Um, it's not that I... I'm, I only, I'm one of these, you know, someone who only wants to select guests if they can give me a massive reach, for example, blue ticks and celebrities and all of that. No, I'm quite happy to interview those people, but I have to be interested in them. Otherwise, it's, bull, it's a bullshit conversation. Uh, so, yeah, but I do see, as it grows, sort of, you know, the, the listener and the viewer base is growing steadily. Um, just organically growing itself without having to put any major effort into marketing or anything like that. But but as it does grow, it will give me access to people I am interested in speaking to and interviewing who I otherwise either can't afford to pay because <laughs> they get paid or they would not be willing to give their time because uh, their time spent doing other stuff that they perceive to be more valuable at the moment, which you can't blame them. Uh, so that's where I see it being in five years' time. Ah, with the addition that I would like to be doing more podcasts a week. So I aim for about one a week at the moment. Uh, I'd like to be doing two or three a week, realistically, in five years' time. Yeah, I think that's achievable. Easily achievable. Okay, the second question is, is there anything, good or bad, that has surprised you? Hmm. I assume, I assume, Larry Boy 776 that you mean... Surprise me about the podcast. Yeah, I think so. I just do two things, really. Um, it's accelerated. I say accelerated. It has broadened my network. So I, I was I like to network before and before I started the podcast anyway, purely for job reasons, uh, for employment prospects, really. Uh, in case I ever didn't have a job or you know, I needed to change jobs, then being well networked is, is good. But the networking side has really surprised me. So what have I done now? This is episode 178. Um, I've done two of these Q&As now. It's 175 hour long, hour plus long episodes where I've spoken to other people. And that has increased my network in a massive way. And what surprises me is that how beneficial that is for everyone else in the network. It's a strange thing to be part of because it's not, the network has, my network hasn't increased because I've been going to networking events, right? It's increased because I'm having real meaningful conversations with every person who stepped into my network. And so everyone has sort of, most most of us in the network, I say as in the network, like most of the people I've met and engaged with through the podcast, we have some sort of, um, you know, it's not, it's not we, we met each other at a networking event, we exchanged fucking business cards, we had a conversation. So I think in terms of uh, trust in in each other, there's a there's a core network which is really trustworthy, really trustful of each other. Everyone in the network, and extended network, the, the second and third connections, you know. And it means that uh, it's much easier, much faster to help people out if they need help or connect people with the right information, the right people, the right team, the right company. Um, if they need assistance, it's just a. I think it's just a more highly productive network than they can otherwise be found, and it's really helped me. And part of the also part of that, you know, meeting all these people and talking to all these people, is. Well, I wasn't a great listener before. Now I'm. I'm very good at listening. Um, I have to be. You know, when I'm doing a podcast, most of the podcasts you listen to them. It's the interviewer, the interviewee, the guest who is speaking most of the time, because I want to hear about their experiences and their knowledge and their and their and their um, their teachings. I want them to teach me stuff. That's why I'm speaking to these people. Or I want to be able to con communicate the information they've got in their minds to other people who can help, right, in whatever way. And so that has made me a really good listener. Um, and it's made me really conscious of the fact, the fact, the absolute fact, that every single person in the world, every single person in the world knows something I don't know. And I know things that nobody else in the world knows. 
my the scope of my knowledge could only be replicated if someone lived exactly the same life as me, exactly the same experience, perceived the events I've gone through in exactly the same way. Uh, everything they don't literally have to be a replica of me in a parallel universe of exactly the same. Otherwise, no one else can can know what I know. There's things I know that you just don't know, and it's the same for everything everyone else. So it gives me a very it's very humbling to know that regardless of who you meet or engage with in society or in work or by walking your dog or, you know, fucking wherever, in the swimming pool, I don't know, not that you meet people when you're swimming, but uh, they have knowledge you don't have. Like, they literally know stuff you don't know, which means that everybody has got a value to you. So everyone is valuable. So everyone should be treated with respect that way. You should never, ever assume that someone is less than you for whatever reason you'd assume that. Maybe you think you've got a better education. Maybe you think because you've got this, ooh, really unusual background. I mean, let's think about military. We all know there's people who think they're better, who are ex-military, who think they're better than everyone else. Or we all know people in general who've got a background and they think they're better than everyone else because of this particular background, be it education, an Oxford education, or an Eton education, or a Cambridge education. And I'm not saying people who go to Oxford, Eton and Cambridge or ex-military all think they're above everyone else. But we know there are people like that. Not the way to be. Not the way to be. So, uh, yeah, it's been a very humbling experience. And I'm, I'm glad I I'm glad I perceive people and the world like that now. I didn't before. You know, I treated everyone, like I think, most people with the respect and dignity everyone should deserve and should they decide to be a bell end and then you'd have to treat them with it. Um but now it's up a level. So I realise that people know stuff I don't know, which means I can learn from people. I can learn from everyone. So you can have knowledge from them. But yeah. I hope that answers your question, buddy. Okay. Paul Hazel, do you still train Brazilian Jiu Jitsu? If so, where? Do I fancy a role? Brackets, not naked. <laughs> I don't, Paul. No, I don't. Um, I haven't trained jujitsu for several years now, and the for the pure and simple fact that where I live at the moment, uh, I can't find um, gyms which have a timetable, so a class timetable that suits my my uh, routine between work and family and all the rest of it so no so I box I, I uh, that's what I do because there's a great boxing gym down the road and they uh, their timetable suits when I when I'm good to train I, I like to train early morning it's like and, and the, the gym down the road they've got early morning session they've got evening session and they fall on the days when I'm available which is really good so no I don't but I, I do I, man if I get more time free up I would 100%, 100% get back into it I'd probably go to the Carlson Gracie gym uh, near me because I've got a there's an ex uh, ex three power lad there I know who he's he's one of the instructors so I'd probably go there and I don't think you go there but I'd come to your gym Paul in fact you know I might break the gear out and come and you can tie me up in knots anyway I know you've been I think you've been here for a couple of years but anyway good question no I don't train it but I do want to again when I get the time freed up Okay, where are we? What have I missed? What have I missed? What have I missed on the Instagram questions? I think. I think we've got them. Right, so let's go on to the the, the, the patron questions, which are in the Discord server. So the link to the Discord server, I'll try and remember to put it in the blurb of this podcast. But if you go on the website, charliecharlie1.com, charliecharlie1.com, yeah, uh, you will see a link there to... Discord server and uh, join is free, it doesn't cost anything. Get in there if you want to get access to the patrons area in Discord, then you need to become a patron, which costs you one of the equivalent of one or two, one or two coffees a month, basically. And to do that, go to patreon.com forward slash HK podcast and join the other patrons there. Okay, questions for Hugh in the Discord server. Where are we? Let's scroll to the top. Um, blah 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 blah. Scrolling up. For those who can't see me, because you're listening. Yes. 
Okay. George Major asks, do you think, do you think if anything is possible, it's still possible for anything to be impossible? Now, when he first, when George first put this in the Discord server, I glanced at it, I think I'd just woken up, and it broke my brain. It broke my brain for several minutes. Um, but coming back to it, so let's repeat the question. Do you think if anything is possible, it's still possible for anything to be impossible? Uh, well, I'm going to stop you there, George. Because I don't think anything is possible. Oh, anything is not possible. That is bullshit. Regardless of what Oprah fucking tells you. Anything is not possible. Uh, for example, have you put your mind to it? Anything is possible. Well, uh, no, I can't go and walk on the surface of the sun, can I? I vaporise. In fact, I'd vaporise super quick because I'm ginger. Um, so I don't think anything is possible. Uh, what is one? He asks again. What is one bit of music or song that plays every time you walk in a room for the rest of your life? Right. This. Mm, I wouldn't. Ah, God. I'm going to cheat you a little bit. I'm going to cheat you a little bit, George. I'm going to choose a Muzak track. So, Muzak is the term for what is basically elevated music. It's music written to innocuously pass the time to neither prompt you know well basically not to prompt any negative emotion in you you get an elevator you're going to be in there for 10 and 20 seconds uh, or you get or you know you know on uh, when you phone up when you're on hold sometimes you get you get music on hold it's just just bullshit music playing away it's not a song it's not a track it's no lyrics it's just some bullshit instrumental put together that's music so i would have music and the reason being is it wouldn't send me round the fucking bend. Imagine choosing one song and walking into a room every single time and it being playing. <sighs> Having said that, if it was going to be one song and I had to choose, it could be music, couldn't be music, I'd choose Bohemian Rhapsody. For the simple reason that Bohemian Rhapsody, Bohemian Rhapsody, contrary to the effect of all other songs, Bohemian Rhapsody seems to be the one song that can come on as much as it wants, as frequently as one as it wants, and it never gets tired. You never get tired of it. You even sing along. You, I mean, how many times have you sung along to Bohemian Rhapsody? A million fucking times. You never get tired of it ever. So I love Bohemian Rhapsody. If I couldn't choose music, well, I hope that answers the question. I did. I did cheat that a little bit, didn't I? Okay, Alan Rankin asks. If you could be a guest on anyone else's podcast, who would your top three be? Um, if I could be a guest. So who would the interviewer be? That I would I'd be a guest on... Uh, it would be Jocko Willink, it would be Joe Rogan, and it would be Jordan Peterson. And not necessarily in that order. Those three, yeah. Jocko Willink, Joe Rogan, Jordan Peterson. And the reason for those three is because I think I could have a decent conversation. I think I've actually got some experience and stuff that would that would not be a detriment to the all to their listeners or the viewers. <laughs> you know, I could bring something to the party when you think some of the unbelievable guests those people have had on. But I but but uh, so I don't listen to Jocko much, but I really like to engage Jocko or discuss you know operational stuff, mission stuff, tactical stuff. Uh, with him, you know, talk through some shared experiences in different places. I suppose when I say shared experiences, I wasn't special forces. Go back to that point. But when I mean shared experiences, I mean, you know, um, being in fucking contact, being in battles, uh, and just bounce off each other that way. Two ex-military uh, shooting the breeze. Uh, Joe Rogan, because well, much the same reason really, apart from the tactical thing. I'd like to speak to him about psychedelic uh, experiences I'd like to speak to him about um, his life experiences What I mean his journey it's fucking wild and uh, I think we'd have a good conversation and I'll just have, have a whiskey smoke a cigar with him and then Jordan Peterson because just anything to be in a room with Jordan Peterson for any period of time would be unbelievable unbelievable I don't I don't get uh, what you call it I don't fanboy out I'm not someone who gets like awestruck by celebrities or you know uh, 
A-listers, for want of a better word, when I've met them or been around them. Um, I just don't. But I think meeting Jordan Peterson would be, would be, would, there is a slight possibility that I would be like, holy fuck, that is the man. Because uh, I have so much respect for him, and he's helped me out in a big way, just through his 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 talks and his books, in a huge way, in a huge way. So yeah, he's a he is a he's a fucking global treasure, that man, and he's more attention being paid to him. Okay, Dave Davis, what's your favourite European city and why? My favourite European city, my favourite European city. Um, I haven't been to many European cities there if I'm, if I'm completely fucking honest I haven't I've not been to many at all uh, let's think about this Barcelona I've been to uh, obviously the ones in the UK uh, well most of the ones in the UK uh, Barcelona um, went to Paris when I was very young uh, I've not been to Berlin did you go there anyway it's not about where I've not been it's about what my favourite my favourite European city is I'm going to say London actually yeah, I'm going to say London. Uh, I love it. I will. Yeah, I've, 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 I do have a, a real love of the UK, uh, Great Britain, UK. Um, those two different, uh, those two different entities. Uh, all of the, all of the countries and principalities and isles that they encompass between the UK and, and Great Britain. I. I love it. And London, I think, is my favourite city. Yes, definitely. Uh, which guest has changed your worldview and why? Now, he's going to be amused at this, but, um, but so be it. Gaz Walsh has. And the reason he has changed my worldview is the way he thinks about things, I think, in a different way. Just a little different way, just different to me. Everyone thinks about things in different ways, right? But the way he thinks about things explains things to me in, in terms of how he perceives world events and politics and even down to social interactions and individuals that you meet, speak to, and whatever. Uh, I it's changed the way I kind of view things and the way I'm viewing things in a different perspective, different for a slightly different perspective. Like generally, has changed the way I view things. In a good way, not in a, like a conspiratorial fucking tinfoil hat way. Not that he's like that <laughs> yet. Well, or is he? Um, but yeah, guys, watch us. Guys, watch us. Show. Yeah. Answer that question. I'm not going to go into depth on, on, on that answer because his head will grow to the size of Jupiter. Okay, Dave Davis. Again, so he asks, can, this is a condensed Desert Island Discs. What are the three tracks you choose to be on a desert island, to be with on a desert island, and why those? Right. The first would be um, by Eric Satie, a Gymnopoly, Gymnopoly number one. And this is a piano track. It's an incredible track. If you, it's, a, it's classical music. But don't be put off by that if you don't like classical music. You'll have heard, you'll have heard this, you'll have heard this, um, what you, this composition, what you call it, this music. You'd have heard this piece on, on films. It's been on a couple of films at least. So go and if you're younger, going to fucking clue them on about people, go and look up Eric Satie, S A T I E, and it's Eric with a K. Gymnopody, number one. Now, shall I attempt to spell Gymnopody? G Y M N. O P well, A D I E maybe Gymnopedy. Just put in Eric Satie Gym one, <laughs> you'll find it. Uh, and I choose that track because it's really melancholy. Um, it's easy to listen to. I could listen to that quite easily in the background, or I could sit there and listen to it as something to focus on. That's number one. The other is a track two and three. I wouldn't want to choose any music of all lyric. Uh, sorry, that I know already well with lyrics because I wouldn't want to ruin the tunes um, I would probably choose a lengthy piece of music from uh, Gamelan like Bal Bali and Gamelan music Dave I was that question you, you probably heard of Gamelan music uh, I'd probably choose a lengthy track of Gamelan for the same reason I chose Eric Saitley's 
Cube Doctor number one. I'll have to choose a lengthy, uh, a lengthy, in like instrumental piece of music, maybe with some lyrics, which which is uh, with the Indian sitar, you know, guitar type instrument. I do that, and the reason for those three is because they're very different types of music. So I would, I'd be able to change up. I'd have different styles there. I can switch it up because uh, quite often it's you like with taste so when you when you eat your food that a change in texture of food has a bigger impact positively on you than the change in texture so if you've been eat, eating soup right tomato soup for fucking eight weeks hypothetically speaking and you change it to oh, and you and you and you change it to tomatoes <laughs> right eating tomatoes for eight weeks that that is much more positive and has a bigger effect it's like oh man that's great the change now, than it would if you if you change the tomato soup to mushroom soup because you're not changing the texture so changing the texture so in the same way the point i'm making is i'd like to think that having three bits of music that are very different in style would reduce the chance of me getting completely fucking fed up with them really quickly <laughs> You know, yeah. As a, so I could have chosen like three rock tracks or something, but oh, you know, whatever. You see my point. Hopefully. Okay. Second of the Desert Island Discs questions. What is the book you would take? I would take. I thought about this already. Hence the quick answer. I would take the Daily Stoic by. Oh, looking at my bookshelf. It's put together by Ryan Holiday, and it is a, a collection of. Uh, musings, a collection of meditations, a collection of um, philosophy and you, you, philosophy, philo philosophical extracts and thoughts from from extremely influential people over the years, from you know uh, leaders of nations to leaders of armies to philosophers and intellectuals. So, I, and there's a, in that book, there's a different. So every it's three hundred sixty six pages, one page for every day of the year. Um, so I was including a leap year, three hundred sixty six pages. Yeah, I bring that, and it helped me get through. It helped my mind to get through that situation of being stuck on a fucking island with uh, gamelan music <laughs> and uh, Eric Satie's Dinopoly Number One, which I instantly would have regret and taken probably, and uh, my sit music. Okay, last last question. What is the luxury item I would take onto the desert island with me? That would be an umbrella. It'd be an umbrella. So I could use it to shelter from the shade if needs be, although I'd like to think there'd be trees on the desert island. And I could have some shade with it. And also I could invert it and catch rain with it. With some delicious drinking water. Rain water to drink. Last meal, he's asking. Okay, there's more questions. Desert Island, what would my last meal be? My last meal, Dave, would be a roast. It would be a roast dinner, and it would be a multiple different meats. So you know, like you go to a carvery, and they go with, with a big hot plate there, like a Toby or something like that, and they say, oh, yeah, uh, what meat do you want? You say, I'll have all three meats, please. And they put the most minuscule amount of meat on your plate. They get like, you get like a half a slice of chicken breast. You get like a crumble of the edge of the the beef joint and you get a bit of gammon on there maybe if you're lucky they'll have crackling left i'd have a roast but i'd have mountains of the meats it'd be like a feast i'd have a big fucking banquet I'd have a big banquet um and it, it'd be gravy my own i'd make my own gravy my own homemade gravy worcester sauce in there whole grain mustard in there uh what else maybe maybe some um maybe some dijon in there as well and some I'd, I'd put probably half a pot of soured cream in there really thick gravy nice with a, with a kick uh one of my top three gigs not been to many gigs dave not been to many gigs but i think i've been to four believe oh no i've been to five. Oh yeah i've been to five yeah so i went to watch roger waters perform the wall then i went to watch roger Wa in fact they were in this order but I watched Roger Waters perform The Wall. Then I watched Roger Waters perform Dark Side of the Moon. I watched the Fratellis perform in the Brixton... Is it the Brixton Roundhouse? I watched 
The Who perform in Liberty Stadium, maybe 2005, I think that was. And I watched, well, I say watched, I caught the first fucking half an hour of the Stereophonics performing up in Scarborough. But I became extremely intoxicated and missed all of the rest of the gig. And I'd been waiting 20 years at that point to go and watch them. Uh, so my top three gigs are the two Roger Waters concerts, because I'm a massive Pink Floyd geek. And I also got to meet Roger Waters backstage at the interval of the wall. Um, and then the, the third one is the Who. When the Who played, it was unbelievable. It was just incredible, incredible gig. Thanks for those questions, Dave. Oh, hang on. He's got one more again. I want the question, Dave. What is the band artist you wish you'd been able to watch? The band or artist you wish you'd been able to watch live? Can I choose more than one? I don't know what I'm asking. It's not like you can respond to me. <laughs> Alright, David Bowie would be number one. David Bowie. Number two would be Jimi Hendrix. Number three would be The Beatles. And number four would be Elvis Presley. Yeah, in that order. Potentially, potentially Joy Division as well. Potentially Joy Division. Yeah. Right. Chris Michaels from the Dark Side Insta Podcast. If you could speak with one person for the last time, who would it be and what would you say? I would... So I've mentioned him... Uh, on a podcast a few times, uh, Pete O'Sullivan, Ronnie O'Sullivan, who uh, the first guy I met when I joined the military, uh, so my oldest military friend, he killed himself in 2016. Um, here we am. But I wouldn't, so what's the question? If you could speak to with one person for the last time, but I wouldn't want it to be the last time. Uh, so I'd speak to him, and I would... Try and talk some sense into him, uh, and try and reassure him that if he just sticks around for a little bit longer, I can help make things ever <clears throat> a little bit better. Yeah. Uh, next question. From Nick B, what what is the most important lesson that life has taught you? Hmm. Going back to everyone knows something you don't. That really means that everyone has value. So everybody in the world has value to someone else. Whether they realise it or not. And so that lesson teaches me that I have value. At my lowest times, one of the, you know, one of the biggest things that was sort of like a, you know, a, a, a barrier to wanting to get help, wanting to improve was the feeling that you, I didn't have value to anyone. I didn't have value to anyone. I don't have any value to myself. And so if you're of no value to anyone, then what, what's the point? So, because, but if you're of no value to anyone and you're in a world of pain mentally, then why are you put up with it? But it's not true. Everyone has value. And so that has been the biggest lesson in life. Whether you realise it or not, you're, you're, you, you have a value. You have a place in society, you fit, you're, you're here for a reason, you fit into a, the fucking massive jigsaw of life and the world and society. And maybe you don't feel like you've demonstrated value or, or you've seen evidence that you have value yet. But life's not finished. <laughs> you never know what's going to happen. And imagine you were not around. Imagine you weren't here anymore. But in the future, someone like you could have been used or that particular knowledge and experience that you've got happened to cross paths with someone else in a certain situation that only in that time, in that circumstance, you would have been perfect to be able to help, to be able to provide a solution, 
or to be able to provide help or to be able to be the person that says hey man I can help you here or you don't need to do that or I can help you get through this and why why not stick around to see the opportunity come up see the opportunity come up yeah you've got value everyone has value that's the lesson regardless from a tramp in the street to the richest person in the world to a fucking CEO like Musk to the President of the United States yes even Biden Biden has value <laughs> um, yeah so that was a deep one that was a deep one uh, Kate England asks sweets or chocolate now I like both but I'm going to say sweets and I'm going to say sweets for one particular piece of confectionery oh, however I tell you what I was eating last night I treat myself I don't eat much sweet stuff at all uh, I treat myself to a pack of Ryzen Reason R-I-E-S-E-N you know the the, the, the the chocolate toffee things kind of big brown packet treat myself to a pack of them last night but sweets purely for wham wham bar the greatest the greatest the greatest piece of confectionery ever made ever made wham bar my god okay fb what do you think is the greatest achievement you have made in your life so far and what makes it your greatest achievement okay i'm going to take this from a, a, a selfish perspective greatest achievement the greatest achievement I don't know if I don't want to, can I, I'm going to change the word in if that's all right I'm going to change it to the most impactful achievement and that goes back that goes back to making the decision to join the military and specifically making a decision to join a unit which had a selection process i.e. power reg because yeah it made me who I am today I think uh, that's not uh, and that's not me I don't mean to disrespect I don't, I don't mean to hit this or throw shade on units without a selection process but I do think that units with a selection process my god it uh, they are very different beasts to those who do not have one so that's the most impact that's the greatest achievement uh, uh, Again, because I wouldn't be who I am today, and I think I'm 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 a much more positive influence on society now than I was, and I think that's a really important thing to aspire to be for anyone. You know, either maintain, just just make sure you, on the balance of things that you're a positive influence in society. And what do I mean by positive influence in society? Being a decent person, treating people the right way, not being a bell end. You know, it doesn't mean going out and being a do-gooder and throwing money and clothes and and at, at the homeless and you know doing all the volunteering in the world you can possibly fit in. And I, I don't necessarily mean that. All that's great stuff, but being a positive member of society is easily achieved by just not being a bell end, not being a bell end interact with people the proper way do things for the right reason conduct yourself accordingly be generally more positive than negative you know control your temper most of the time all the time if you can but at least most of the time you know uh, treat people with the respect they deserve everyone everyone deserves your respect until they don't everyone has value and they should be treated as such and should be respected as such until they don't deserve that respect Treat people on their actions. Don't judge a book by its cover. All that good stuff. So yeah, um, I think that answers your question. <laughs> I think I lost myself a bit there. Uh, right, Grumps asks, rich tea or digestives? Digestives, if you're dipping them in tea, I oh, digestives all day long. Actually, I do like mm, I do like rich tea, but I'd go for digestives every time. Uh, 
Chris Michaels Dark Side Insta Podcast. We need to air with these questions, but I Chris Michaels Dark Side Insta Podcast. If you could visit one period of history, what would it be and why? I would I have I have thought about this in the past. I would visit the moments before the Big Bang. So I'm not a creationist, I'm not a religious person. I was brought up I was brought up in a in a Roman Catholic family. I was brought up to be Roman Catholic. I, I had my Holy Communion, I had to study, I did all that shit. No. I don't mean shit, well, yeah, shit. And, uh, but I believe in, you know, evolution. I believe in the Big Bang. I believe in the way we evolved, Darwin. Um, but the one thing, the one element of doubt, I of doubt I have in my mind. So you could describe it as, a, as an atheist, probably. But the one, el- the one thing that sows there's two things that sow an element of doubt in my mind about whether there is some sort of higher power. I don't want to say like divine, you know, divine being, but some sort of higher power, some sort of creator. The one thing that sows doubt that, that says to me that could be, that could be the case. Maybe. We don't know. There's obviously some, there's a probability that is the case, but scientists don't think so, right? The, one, the two things that sow those elements of doubt for me are, one, the Big Bang, right? Things don't happen. It's cause and effect. The Big Bang didn't just fucking happen. Something started that. Something, right? And let's say, I don't know, it, let's say it was some, some other universe imploding but preceded this universe. What started that? What is at the what is at the start of time? I don't believe the Big Bang is the start of time because where did it come from? You can't get something from nothing. You can't, it's not possible. Well, not you know, to our knowledge, it's not. Right? You can't get something from nothing. So certainly, there was something before the Big Bang. What was it? There was something before that singularity. What was it? That's point one. Where I think, hmm, is there something up there? Is there something bigger? I haven't said that. Having said that, right, if you go and say, oh yeah, well there was a divine being, or there was a creator, or there was aliens, or whatever you want to say that kicked off the Big Bang, then you can go back a stage again and say, well what the fuck created them? What created them? Like, that's the mad thing. At some point then, there must have been something from nothing. Unless, there's always been something, and time and space is infinite. In which case there is no start. And that is even more boggling. That boggles the mind even more. There is something that has no start and no end. And yet we're in the middle of it. And we have a start and an end. Our lives extinguish. There's no start and end. There's no uh, infinite life for us. And not the way we understand it anyway. So that's Jesus Christ. Where am I going with that? So that's part one of why th- there is an inkling of uh, a creator, maybe. And the other thing is... Right, the, so, so the universe is expanding, right? If, uh, and it's been proven that the universe is, is expanding at the moment. Some scientists believe, I think most now, uh, or, or uh, theoretical physicists believe that it will get to a point and they start contracting. But if it's expanding, what's expanding? What is it expanding into? What's outside it? What is outside of the universe? Beyond the edge of the universe, what is there? What is there? It's expanding into something. It can't be nothing. You can't... It, well, maybe. So, yeah, I'm not even going to go down discussing that bit. The, 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 uh, the origins of the universe blew my mind there when I was thinking about it. But, yeah, so what, what is it expanding into? Holy shit. Holy shit. Oh, yeah, an hour and 13 in you. Okay, any more questions? Just looking on the Discord server. Uh, Jay Rank, Jay Jay Tyler asked uh, on, on Instagram. I did answer earlier. Jay Tyler asked, "Do I shave my man garden?" He's a fucking moron. Jay Tyler, you're a fucking moron. He's not a moron. He's a good guy, but I think he's angling for a sponsorship from Manscaped. I tell you what, I doubt he shaves his man garden. But a state on his head here, his fucking barnet that he's got going on top of his head, like the like the nutty professor. Not a nutty professor. <laughs> was the nutty professor? That was uh, Eddie. Eddie, oh man, Eddie, the black commentator, uh, the black uh, comedian, 
Shit, I got his name. Anyway, not the Nutty Professor. Mad Professor, J. Tyler. Um, okay, that is all the questions. Yes. Right, look forward to episode 179, which should be released next week. I'm not going to tell you who it is. And I'll catch you in the next one. If you want to support the podcast, you support me. Again, price of one or two coffees a month. You can join all the other patrons. Most of the questions there came from patrons. You can go to uh, patreon.com forward slash HK podcasts. You can also be trendy. You can do it via cryptocurrency as well, actually. You can go on to the website, chinechollywood.com, hit become a patron on the menu. And it'll take you to options there. Yeah. Uh, and then for patrons who do that, they get access. so every podcast gets released. When it goes public, the patrons are already at it for a period of time, sometimes days, sometimes weeks. So they get access, early access to all the podcasts. They get access to um, a monthly Zoom call with myself and other patrons. And sometimes we have a previous guest comes on and they have a private Q&A with that guest. We've had, uh, we've had um, Huey Morgan on, you know, from Fun Living Criminals. We've had Alec Goff on. We've had, I think we have Will Carlin on. Uh, a bunch of people have come and done it. And they get free merch, merchandise giveaways every month. That stopped for a bit. We were trying to find a different a different way of doing things, but it's started back up now. And what else? What else? Oh, the Discord server. You get access to the exclusive patron only access to private parts of the Discord server. So. It is well worth it. Discord, the, 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 the existing patrons, the current patrons are fucking awesome. Awesome bunch. Great, great bunch of people. And it's a good community to be a part of. But, um, no pressure. Don't have to if you don't want to. Just keep listening to the podcast. I'll keep watching it whatever you want. Leave it a review and throw guest suggestions my way. If you enjoy listening to a podcast, make sure you contact the guest. Let the guests know. Get on Twitter, get on Instagram, whatever, if you can do it that way, or LinkedIn. Let them know. They love hearing the feedback as well. So that is it. Uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Until next time. Out. That's it. Thank you for watching Hey Chower. If you enjoyed this episode, why not become a hey chower patron hey chower patrons get exclusive access to premium content with guests like the one you just watched there are private interviews with previous guests and with this guest that nobody will see except for the hey chower patrons so before this podcast was recorded i recorded an exclusive q a a shorter interview structured around eight questions all the questions were chosen by patrons beforehand and that interview is online now for patrons that happens every time patrons also get access to all of the episodes before anyone else they get advanced viewing of the episodes and you also get other perks and bonuses all of the information is on charliecharlie1.com just hit the menu item become a patron it'll show you everything there including access to the h hour discord community and private patron only channels on there so go to charliecharlie1.com and hit the menu item become a patron easy peasy if you prefer to listen to your podcast normally h hour is also on spotify it's on apple Podcasts. it's on google Podcasts. it's on all of the podcast apps and if you don't even want to bother with a podcast app you can go to the, the h hour website charliechannel1.com and you can actually play the podcast video or audio directly through the website through your browser simples thank you for watching thank you for being a supporter like the video subscribe to the channel and i will catch you on the next episode thank you